Welcome, everyone. This is the um, a June, what is it, May 23rd special meeting of Yellow Springs Village Council. We've already called the roll because we were in executive session earlier. Um, I do want to say that we understand that this is a very unusual and unexpected time for a public meeting. It was called um, at our last meeting because there is an issue related to an annexation of internal to the village, which I'm going to let Patty talk about to describe the piece of property. That's why this meeting was called. It was to facilitate and expedite a situation for a citizen who would purchase land that she wants to develop. Um, because of the situation with the uh, medical cannabis company was happening at exactly the same time, we knew with the speed of um, discussion and decision making on that, that it made sense to, to roll some discussion of that into this meeting. So we took advantage of the fact that we already had this special meeting scheduled to also include the medical cannabis discussion in here. This isn't the last discussion. It isn't the first discussion because it was discussed at the last meeting and it isn't, certainly isn't the last discussion. There is no intent for there to be any um, any hidden agenda here or any, any trying to keep anything from the public. We are just trying to take advantage of an opportunity. So um, the first order of business here is actually the legislation regarding the annexation. And I somehow lost my agenda. Um, here's the agenda. So uh, first we have resolution 2017-23. And Judy, let's just read this by title only. Certainly. This is adopting a statement indicating the services the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio will provide to the territory proposed to be annexed to the Village of, of Yellow Springs, Ohio, pursuant to a petition filed with the Board of County Commissioners of Greene County, Ohio, filed by the petitioners Patricia Gustafson and Carol Smith, for the annexation of 1.713 acres of land, more or less, in Miami Township, Greene County, Ohio, to the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, as provided by Ohio Revised Code, Section 709.023C. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. OK. Uh, Patty. Okay. Uh, Trish Gustafson owns property on North High Street near uh, Fairfield Yellow Springs Road. She purchased a lot immediately behind her property that is um, technically in the township but is completely surrounded by village annexed properties. She wishes to annex that property into the village so that she can develop it, build a, build a home on it for her son is what she wants to do. Um, it has access onto North High Street and um, that's it. She would just like to annex it in so she can have the uh, utilities and build the home. And, and I think folks familiar with this property would probably recognize it as the Nickerson property. So it's, it's off of High Street. It, it's kind of connected in. It was sold um, in, in a number of parcels right. in the last couple of years. Right, as and part I, of an auction. I, we do have, I'm sorry we don't have a visual for the screen, we do have plans here, a site plan here if anybody's interested in seeing it, but it's property that um, the property owner originally did not want annexed in, um, but now as, as for this particular uh, homeowner, property owner, they do want to build and they do want uh, village utilities, which is why they want to annex. And, and, as, and as Patty said, it's fully surrounded by village property already. Any comments or questions from council? I think it makes sense. We want all property within the village to be part of the village. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Comments or questions from citizens? Yes, Joe. My name is Joe Lewis. <clears throat> the property that you're talking about is surrounded by property that's already in the village. That's yes. Correct? That's correct. So how, how will they uh, obtain access to High Street? She owns a lot already on High Street. Um, and and I, it's on here on the part which I can show you. This is the lot she wants to annex in. This is the lot that she actually owns. Um, Judy's bringing it out to you. And so she has, the, she has access through this lot, which is in the village, back to this property immediately behind it. So her access would be through this lot to this property. So, we're, so there's a house there. On, that's a house on High Street. She owns it. And she's going to give. So this is directly behind that house. It's directly behind. 
and she's going to live in one house and her son is going to live in the other. Or her mother's going to live in one house and she and her son are going to live in the other, I should say. <laughs> okay. So there's, going, there's a new lot that's coming in behind an existing lot which, is, which fronts on High Street. That's correct. So this particular lot then that you're going to annex has no direct access to High Street except going through an existing lot. That's correct. Denise, do you want to, Denise has talked to her, I believe. Have you talked to Trish? Okay. Um, she is going to, she's going to take an easement off of the existing lot and provide a driveway access back to this property. Okay. So that, so that, so they have to give a, um, <clears throat> I say a lot access forever to that particular lot. That's correct. They will not. No they won't be allowed to put a house on it. It won't pass Denise until they do that. This is just the annexation. They haven't presented their plans for the for the home yet. That's a requirement. Is that that this lot be provided with that permanent access? Okay. Yep. Denise is coming. Um, wh while we're waiting for this, I know Pleasant Street, does Pleasant Street have the potential of going back to that lot? No. I, I, mm -hmm. it, it, there's a sort of dirt road that goes back off of Pleasant. Pleasant, Pleasant Street, dead ends right there. There's a dirt access, but I don't really know if it's yeah. part of Pleasant. Denise, did you want to speak? Uh, just that the zoning code does allow for, uh, the, you have to have your lot on and before they build that lot they would be required to show that access right. Somebody give me this. any other comments or questions from citizens council are be ready to vote all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. Uh, next is resolution 2017-24 this is consenting to the annexation of 1.713 acres of land, more or less, in Miami Township, Greene County, Ohio, to the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, pursuant to a petition filed with the Board of County Commissioners of Greene County, Ohio, as provided by Ohio Revised Code Section 709.023C. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, Patty, can you explain the differentiation of these two pieces of legislation? Or Chris? I yeah, these are duties. Um, okay. th this essentially conveys to the Board of County Commissioners that the Village of Yellow Springs is fine with the annexation. The first says, yes, we will provide the same services we would provide to any home in the village. And the second one says, we are fine with this annexation because the Board of County Commissioners are the, are, is the entity that actually passes the annexation. It will then come back to the Village of Yellow Springs for a final approval of the annexation. So this just indicates to the Board of County Commissioners that you are fine with this plan. Okay. Any comments or questions from Council? Comments or questions from citizens? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, the next piece of legislation regards um, the sale of village-owned property. I think will will hold that, or uh, to enter into negotiations. I think will hold that legislation and just start the discussion um, of the opportunity that's been presented uh, related to the medical cannabis opportunity. Um, so, about a week ago, I received a phone call a couple of days before um, the last council meeting. Um, I received a phone call and outreach from uh, folks from the company called Cresco Labs. Um, they have facilities in Illinois and um, where the medical cannabis operation is very similar to what's being introduced in the state of Ohio. Um, they in indicated interest in Yellow Springs as a possible location for their operation. Their operation is related to um, uh, the cultivation and the production of the final product, no distribution. I don't want to get into a lot of details. There are folks here that can talk about that. Um, the folks from Cresco are here. 
Um, it's pretty complicated. Where, where Ohio has taken it is pretty complicated, but as they've described, um, Ohio has actually taken some of what was learned in Illinois and improved it. So um, they're actually pretty pleased with um, the process that Ohio has come to. Um, we have spent, the st and, and the state of Ohio has essentially set the time frame. So they just recently released the regulations for cultivation and production. And I, I'm not even sure that all of the production regulations are quite out yet. And, but they want these licenses submitted by the end of June. And as part of that license submission requirement, they are required to have an option or at least know what site they are going to be uh, proposing. So that puts us in a situation if we are interested in having this company, this business in our community, that puts us in a situation of having to respond in a much uh, more rapid way than we are used to responding. And that is why that we've, we've moved it to a priority item on our agenda, um, recognizing um, the, the discussions that are, we're, we're in the midst of discussions of what happens with the property known as the CBE. And um, this kind of puts itself right in, in the middle of those discussions. So we want to find a way, and, and we're, we, we invited you here to find a way to get that out into the community as much as possible. Um, we, the past two days they've been in town, we've been having stakeholder meetings, we've met with school board officials, we've met with school superintendent, we've met with law enforcement officials, local and county. Um, today we met, we met with business leaders, we met with township officials, um, we've met with adjacent property owners. Um, so we've, we're, and, and now we're talking to the community as a whole. We've, staff has been involved walking the site, looking at the site, seeing how it works. Um, and, and it seems to work f for their needs. Um, so um, we're, we're excited at the opportunity um, from, from the standpoint of the tax, the tax opportunities. We have income tax, we have property tax. Um, these folks are, um, are, are not coming asking for tax abatements or any sort of, of anything like that. Um, the opportunities for the schools are good in, as far as taxes are concerned. We're looking at, at, at just at, at potential tax relief for our, our citizens. We're not exactly sure, Melissa, Finance Director Melissa Dodd and um, Don Weller from the schools are going to meet with the county auditor to, to start to put together exactly what the tax implications are for our citizens for property tax. It's certainly going to be a benefit. It's either going to bring put more tax revenue in into our coffers or it's going to relieve the burden, the existing burden on citizens. We're looking to find out exactly what that means. It all has to do with millage and, and how that all works. Um, income tax, certainly we're talking um, starting out maybe around 20 to 30 jobs at the end of the day, potentially around 60 jobs. We have income tax. There's a lot of opportunity for local, um, local employment. Um, this is a, as a business that comes in with no employees, and um, so, so they will be hiring um, and, and are looking to hire as many locals as possible. Um, and these are also good jobs. Right. Um, we're talking about average wage of 40000 annually. Um, I know one of the other things we want to emphasize, because this, this hits a lot of the pieces of our affordability discussions, this would be a business that's a heavy utility user, uh, which would be very important for the village as well. A heavy utility user, but in a, in a conscientious way. Um, they, we, environmentally, um, it, it, they're, they're, their process is sound. Um, and again, I'm not going to sit here and talk about what that is. I'm going to let them talk about it. But, um, and, and also, they've already indicated and they, and they have demonstrated in their locations in Illinois that they are um, good community partners in terms of returning um, revenues and returning funds to the community. Um, so that's another piece. They're very conscious of, of partnerships, working with, um, again, to employ locals, 
potentially to develop training programs. They're really looking to develop as much local um, uh, opportunity as possible. Um, I don't, I mean, should, I what do we want to do? Do we want to? Um, I think we should have. Have Chris and or have Charlie, yeah. Yep. Charlie, so I'll introduce Charlie Bachtel. Um, and if you want to come up to the, to the microphone, and I mean, a, a much abbreviated. Um, <laughs> you, you've heard it uh, seven times yeah. in, the, in the last 24 hours. Um, thank you for having us again. My name is Charlie Bachtel. I feel like I'm addressing the people behind me, though. So, um, is there that, I, that will come out if you would rather carry it and maybe speak to yeah, the and folks. we won't we won't it be offended. Mics right. to the TV too. I think. Yeah, okay. I mean, so you need the mic, but you can turn around. We won't be offended. We okay. prefer you talk Maybe to I'll the community. Too, yeah, so that's can, great. I'll get a wide sure. breadth. Um, again, thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Charlie Bachtel. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Cresco Labs. We're a medical cannabis operation. Um, that originated in Illinois. Um, we also have licenses in Puerto Rico, uh, recently applied in Pennsylvania, and are looking at the Ohio program as well with our Ohio partners. Um, the long story short, um, you know, we're, Cresco was founded in 2013 when medical cannabis law came to Illinois. Uh, prior to that, uh, me and my partners uh, were, you know, we're not your traditional uh, cannabis industry people. We um, I'm a lawyer myself. Prior to this, three of the four of us worked in the banking industry. Um, I was general counsel executive vice president for one of the larger uh, residential mortgage lenders in the country. My partner was chief operating officer and other partner was uh, director of mortgage lending. So we, we've somewhat taken a, um, a very compassionate but also a, a, a experience in heavily regulated industry approach uh, to what medical cannabis is. Illinois was uh, one of the first states to adopt what the industry somewhat refers to as Generation 2 model of medical cannabis, where it is a, it's a true medical program. Um, whereas um, maybe some of the more pioneering traditional industries, uh, the programs that you've seen out west, um, this is intended to be very highly regulated, uh, very compliance focused. Um, that's the reason for the limited license nature of this. It's to create a program that's controllable and um, you know, a, a limited number of operators helps the government regulator uh, make sure that they're aware of everything that's going on in these facilities. And you know, the vernacular is really from, truly from seed to sale. Um, this product is tracked and, and, and monitored and, and regulated. Um, you know, we, the, the way that we looked at uh, medical cannabis is, is truly first with that compassionate view. Um, uh, my partner himself is a leukemia survivor, so when this did come up in Illinois, that's, he was the one that brought it to our attention and said, hey, we should, we should take a look at this. Um, I went home that night, I read the law, and I, I could tell you I was, I was truly impressed with how sophisticated and how compliance focused um, the program was. Uh, you know, my, um, for better or worse, I think uh, my preconceived notions of what medical cannabis is, um, and it might be the same for uh, the people in the audience, is, it, it looks a lot more like Venice Beach um, than I think what you'll see the medical cannabis program in Ohio looking like. Um, this, is, this is high compliance, this is commercial agriculture, this is pharmaceutical manufacturing and, uh, and, and product formulation. This is, um, you know, uh, very, uh, from a security and surveillance standpoint, it's a, it's a very well controlled environment. Um, it's a clean environment. It, um, uh, again, it's a, it's a level of sophistication that um, these new programs, Illinois, New York, uh, Minnesota, um, soon to be Maryland, and uh, in Ohio, Pennsylvania as well, this is a model that's been adopted going forward. So um, part of our experiences in Illinois, I, I can tell you it's, it hasn't been uh, an easy road. Um, some people also have uh, sort of incorrect preconceived notions about this being a, an immediately lucrative industry to get into, I can tell you firsthand it's not. Um, there's a lot of capital expense associated with it. There's a lot of hard work that has to go into it. But if done correctly, um, a program can be successful um, and to do the right things, which is to provide quality controlled medicine for patients in the state. Um, uh, Illinois, you know, I, I can tell you, as, of course, with guys not having uh, traditional cannabis backgrounds, it was, it was critical for us to work with an operational partner. 
um, during our first endeavor into this space. So we work with a, uh, a group called Denver Relief out of uh, Colorado, one of the, um, the oldest running up until last year when they sold their operation. They were the longest running uh, operator in the city of Denver. And um, they did a, a phenomenal job with us in instilling this concept of community awareness, community integration, and community benefit as part of the program. Um, it, you know, I was explaining to the group earlier, this is a very unique industry. Um, the, the, the way that these programs are being set up now are, are not only from a, not just a regulated compliance focused uh, industry, but it's also based on compassion and integration. Um, it's, a, it's a requirement as you go through these processes that the state feels that this is something that's good for the community that it's in, that it involves all stakeholders within that community, and that this is a supported um, program within any community. It's something that we um, uh, committed to very on, or early on when we were looking at this in Illinois, and it was, it was developing community integration plans, community benefit plans, and having that, um, you know, ho however it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's termed, um, in Illinois, they're referred to sometimes as hosting agreements, but um, some sort of a give back program that is a revenue share with the community. Um, again, the state, the state wants to see this be a success on all fronts, and it really is that comprehensive, all-encompassing, um, all-buy-in stakeholder uh, position that really does make this program a success. Uh, I can tell you again from firsthand experience in Illinois, the process isn't easy. Um, you know, there's going to be a couple hundred applicants that apply for these. There's going to be 12 larger uh, scale licenses and 12 smaller scale licenses. There's going to be a lot of applicants that submit applications for these. Um, it's going to require a, a very thoughtful and a very holistic approach to, you know, showing the state that you have the ability to actually do this, um, to get it off the ground, to actually build the buildings, to uh, implement the standard operating procedures, to run a compliant operation, but also that you are a good um, community member and that um, there are components that are part of this program for um, disadvantaged groups and minorities, that all of that is part of this. So it's a great opportunity to not only do that because um, you want to, but the state wants to see it too. So it's a it's a win-win scenario gets created. Um, in Illinois, for the, there's 21 licenses in Illinois. As I mentioned, Ohio is going to have 12 large and 12 small. Um, Illinois was similar, but there were just 21 uh, across the board. So um, we had submitted three uh, applications with the, the just to you know with the hopes of winning one, and um, we ended up the the three applications we submitted were three of 158, and we ended up receiving the the highest score, the second highest score, and the third highest score. So uh, being able to develop the plan. Um, apparently it was something that we were we were good at. We did a good job of doing it. Um, I can also tell you there's two parts to being a, an operator in this uh, in these programs. You, one is you have to win the licenses to it, and two is then you actually have to operate a, a real company um, after the fact. It, it doesn't do you any good to run around with a piece of paper. Um, so you have to, you know, we built three buildings. We have three 40,000 square foot facilities in Illinois. Um, we had to, you know, really not only finalize but implement our standard operating procedures. We had to hire staff. We had to plant plants. Um, we had to prove that we could do it. Um, it's not easy. Uh, as I mentioned, these, these new programs, these Generation 2 programs, uh, you start with patient number one. Uh, it's a little bit different than, you know, I think what people think about um, when you look at Colorado and you look at Washington and you look at Oregon and you look at California. Um, that you just sort of hang your shingle on the outside and you have a line around the corner. That's not the case when you start with patient number one, followed by patient number two, followed by patient number three. You have to get people to uh, not only um, be familiar with the fact that medical cannabis is coming to their state where it hasn't been before, um, but then they have to understand that they're a qualifying patient and then once they're comfortable with the subject matter, they have to go have that conversation with their physician. So there's a tremendous amount of awareness and education that goes into making sure that the public, potential patients, and the medical community are comfortable with the idea of, of cannabis as a medicine in the state of Ohio. It's something that we've been through in Illinois. And I can tell you, it's, it, it, you might think that it's a given, it isn't. Um, medical communities, physicians, they're not, uh, they haven't learned about this yet. And, um, uh, you know, at least the physicians that I, I know uh, well, they don't just sort of do research on the side for fun. 
Um, they have enough things to think about and enough things to learn in their, in their daily practices to where this is a new concept for them. And they, they are the gatekeepers to access to the program. This is, a, this is going to be a true medical program. You're not going to have the, um, you know, the quote unquote pot docs that you've seen in other pioneering states where people can easily just say, you know, I have a, a rotator cuff injury from high school baseball and, and get a card. Uh, this is going to be true conditions, having conversations between patients and their, their actual physicians with pre-existing relationships. So, uh, short story longer, um, the one thing I could tell you is the experience in Illinois has really prepared us to be able to go into uh, uh, other programs in other states, especially ones that are primarily based on the regulations that were developed in Illinois, like Ohio, and uh, have the experience of knowing what it takes and having the assets that have already been developed, have already been created, where we can work with uh, Ohio partners and really just implement a proven concept that's been successful um, in Illinois, you know, through our sort of holistic approach to awareness, education, messaging, um, being out there, being an advocate, making sure that everything we do meets our um, it's a boring word, but appropriate is really our, our sort of standard that we apply to um, everything from a branding, from a packaging standpoint and a messaging standpoint. It's been that real holistic, thorough approach that's allowed us to um, be successful in the program. Um, you know, for the last five months in a row, we've, we've had a, um, the largest market share of, of, uh, of Illinois' program. So that sort of approach, that, that true, um, you know, starting with grassroots and that building through the community and awareness and education with patients, um, that truly is a win-win scenario because if you engage in that and you do it um, with a full intensity, it actually relates to um, success in, in having the patients uh, utilize your medicine as well. So with that, that brings us to Yellow Springs. And, and as we were looking at Ohio and looking for different areas where um, community engagement and community involvement could be a big component of the application process for us and then definitely part of the post-license operation uh, aspect of, of running this business. Um, Yellow Springs has worked its way to the top of the list. And I can tell you in the, in the week or so that we have been engaging with council, um, it has been refreshing to see um, the excitement and the willingness to engage in the conversation and from my limited time that I've spent here over the last couple of days, uh, I see it in the community. I think there's, uh, again, the way that these programs are structured, there's such an incentive to not only you have to do it, but you want to do it because this truly is what will make the, the program here in o Ohio a success, is making sure that all the operators really buy into this community engagement perspective. It helps to get that trust. This is, this is a polarizing subject matter. No matter where you fall on one line or the other, there's no doubt about it that this is a controversial, polarizing uh, subject matter. So by having community engagement, community involvement, that spreads and that permeates through the rest of the state to, and, and the, even up to the, to the politicians and the General Assembly. When they see that a community is involved in this and that it's not just operators trying to produce products, but it really is a, a sort of a real partnership effort, um, that helps create a successful program. And that's what we're trying to do here in Ohio. And, um, that is what brings us to, to Yellow Springs. Um, I don't know if I, anything in particular that I think uh, you think I should. Uh, maybe talk briefly about the facility. Sure. So um, in Illinois, with having three facilities, we've had the, um, uh, the ability to have both types of, of the traditional types of facilities that you'll see in commercial uh, cannabis cultivation today. So you have, we have two fully enclosed indoor facilities that are, they look somewhat like um, medium-sized grocery stores. It's tilt up precast concrete construction, 30 foot high, and um, fully indoor, fully enclosed. And then the third facility is what's referred to as a modern hybrid greenhouse. And calling it a greenhouse kind of does it a disservice. Um, greenhouse kind of connotates a, a temporary structure or a, or a flimsy structure. Uh, this is more of a this is a more of a, a corrugated metal insulated walled warehouse that just also happens to have a translucent roof, um, and the roof is it's not transparent so you can't see through it. It's it's kind of like a frosted light bulb, um, and what it does is it allows you to utilize the the power of the sun when the sun is available 
Um, and then, of course, you have full environmental controls on the inside, so you have supplemental lighting and light deprivation capabilities, so you can uh, control that environment as well. So the type of facility that we would be looking to build here is this modern hybrid greenhouse type facility. Um, you have uh, what we've shown to be identical quality control standards. You can, you can produce the same quality product out of both of these types of facilities. Um, this type of facility allows you to do it at about a 45% savings. Um, being able to use the sun, as, as they had mentioned, uh, the carbon footprint of, of uh, cannabis cultivation is pretty significant. So if you can do anything that will limit uh, the amount of natural resources that you have to rely on um, or to pay for, uh, it, it, uh, it, it absolutely can uh, um, it creates a, a better growing environment for it. So um, secure buildings and, and more so uh, than just secure a well-surveilled um, property. If so this will be a property, um, the one we have in Lincoln and, and Joliet, they, they have perimeter fencing, but it's not, um, it's not uh, I guess was, as I've explained before, you could either, you can go the, the full show of force type of secured environment, or you can go with strategic um, uh, sort of inconspicuous but uh, equally as effective uh, ways of creating a secure environment and that's traditionally how these generation two um, companies have done it so it's a um, you know chain link perimeter fence but it's a special kind of chain link fence that makes it very difficult to climb and there's not like spools of razor wire at the top of it but there is um, sort of prevention methods at the top of it which would prevent someone from wanting to climb over there's um, a secured gate at the front. Uh, all all um, all guests to the facility have to be approved in advance, uh, 24 hours in advance by the state. So um, it's not open to the public. Um, it, it's a facility that's intended for cultivation and manufacturing of products. So it's also I want to be clear: this isn't a retail. Um, this isn't a retail facility. This is not a point of sale or a point of purchase. This is this is commercial agriculture and manufacturing. Um, once you get within within the gate, uh, the interior security and, and surveillance components come into play. And um, I've heard it described by uh, law enforcement at our facility of once you get inside, oh, this reminds me of, of the way the jail works. So there's there's man trap areas when you go from certain sections to other sections, when you go from non-production to production. Um, there's all kinds of processes that are put in place with limited access areas that only certain employees, their, their key fobs work to get in those areas versus restricted areas where their key fobs with those employees will let them go in those areas. Uh, our employees all wear um, scrubs and they're different colored scrubs which identify the areas of the facility that they have access to. So you'll have the red scrubs that allow you to get into limited access and green scrubs that'll let you get into restricted access. Um, it really is truly, um, it is very clean uh, modern indoor agriculture and then once you get to the other side of the facility it is pharmaceutical production it's it's extraction and formulation and it's done in clean rooms um, it's done by you know people wearing lab coats and uh, making sure that that medicine is consistent it's precisely dosed um, and that it's something that patients can rely on um, can you specifically let's talk about the, the roof the light the odor, odor control, sure. uh, pesticides, and runoff. Uh, I'll take them in those order. Uh, in those order. So the light. Um, it was it was brought to our attention that there was a concern that at night there could be light emitting from this facility. So, without a doubt, um, cannabis is a light determinant plant. So the way that you do this in indoor cultivation is you control the environment throughout its entire lifespan. That's how you control exactly how this plant grows and you, you create a consistent agricultural product, which isn't easy. Um, so controlling the amount of light that a plant gets is critical. Um, through one stage of life, it needs 20 hours of light um, as if it was sunlight. That's the vegetative stage where it grows tall and it grows wide. Um, 20 hours of light on, four hours off. Some people do 18.6, there's different ways you could do it, but um, more than 14 hours a day is what it needs to vegetatively grow. So in a, in a winter m month where, you know, I'm assuming there's probably, I don't know, less than eight hours of sunlight, nine hours of sunlight during the day, um, you absolutely need that supplemental lighting because I have to give it 20 hours of daylight. Um, in a greenhouse environment, and this happened to us at our facility in, in Lincoln, it's sunlight, it's pure, it's pure sunlight coming out of the roof of this building. Um, the way to remedy that, uh, after the law, law enforcement sent us a nice cell phone picture of our facility going, are you guys aware that this is what your facility looks like from the outside? Um, the light deprivation shades that you use to be able to 
turn off the light. So when we go from vegetative state to growth state, now the plant only gets 12 hours of light a day and it gets 12 hours of dark. So in a summer day, when you might get 14 or 15 hours of daylight here, I need to be able to shut off the light so we have full blackout light deprivation capability, which allows me to create a totally dark environment in that room while it's still light outside. So the fix to the, to the light coming out at night issue is you close those light deprivation shades and it just the same way that it keeps sunlight out during the day, it keeps the light in when you run the lights at night. Um, from an odor perspective, that, that tends to be an issue um, without a doubt in some of those more pioneering markets. Um, where you have, you know, there's an area of Denver that's an old warehouse district where you have a very high concentration of cultivation activity going on. And those are retrofitted warehouses that were never intended for this purpose. So, you know, odor pollution isn't a, a gigantic concern for them. So it absolutely, it, it can leave the facility. That's why you have, uh, you have odor control. Um, we have carbon filtration systems on all of our exhausts through our building. We had an issue, excuse me, at one of our facilities in Joliet where the system wasn't working correctly. We were notified about it and we haven't had a situation since. Um, I can tell you that when you pull up to our facility um, and you park in the parking lot, you would, have, uh, you would have no knowledge that you were next to a 40,000 square foot cultivation facility. As soon as you walk in the door through the second set of doors, you, you will. Um, so it, the, the, what I can say is that the, the, the odor remediation systems work. Um, Environmental? Um, well, runoff, runoff and Runoff's pesticides. Very, yeah, so herbicide. water runoff is very, uh, very little. There's, there's, there's multiple ways. There's, there's a thousand ways to grow cannabis, and everybody has their own cultivation methodologies. Um, ours don't include flooding tables or even hand watering for a certain amount of time. Ours is a fully automated um, system. We use a system called Hortamax, which is a very common traditional um, greenhouse um, uh, commercial agriculture system that monitors and manages all of your functions. So we have, you know, we have monitors in our rooms that are constantly taking feedings of temperature, um, humidity, CO2 levels, um, pressure, and it also controls our, our watering and nutrient system. So the plants, we use a drip system methodology. and. From a runoff perspective, uh, there's little to none. Sometimes there'll be an accumulation of it on the table, but it's never really enough to even make it to the drain. Um, it, uh, it dries and evaporates before it makes it to the drain. So from a runoff perspective, very little. I would also say that in Illinois, we tell people all the time that we were, we've been forged in the fires of Illinois. Illinois has been an incredibly difficult uh, medical cannabis program. That's what happens when you're first. Um, when you try to create uh, regulation, a, a lot of times uh, a little bit of over-regulation happens. But there's a lot of good things that come from that. You, we've, we've learned how to deal with some very uh, difficult situations. And again, as I said earlier, the experience in learning what it takes to actually make these things work um, is, uh, is really important. Um, part of that is the pesticide restrictions in Illinois. So there's a very, very limited list of what they consider pesticides, which for the most part consist of um, different types of oil, like peppermint oil, um, that we're allowed to use during the vegetative state, so in the first 30 days of the life of this plant. But once we put it into the flowering or broom, uh, bloom uh, rooms, which is the last 60 to 70 days of its life, we're not allowed to put a single thing on that plant uh, even uh, foliar sprays. So the only thing that we do, we have, of course, you have to develop an integrated pest management system because no matter how, how controlled your environment is, when you're doing this in the middle of soybean and cornfields in Illinois, like we would be here, um, there's an opportunity for pests to work their way in uh, one way or another. So you have to have an integrated pest management system. It's it's part of the way that our, our cultivation uh, methodologies work, the way that we prune plants, the way that we get rid of any sort of undergrowth. We allow for a lot of airflow. We allow uh, for, for a, a nominal amount of plant growth that doesn't have direct light. Um, and we also use uh, um, predator bugs, which I didn't know existed until I got into this. Um, but they're little beneficial bugs, uh, very common again in, in greenhouse growing. Um, where they, uh, they look for those pests that would impact the plant and they actually, um, it's its own little ecosystem. So 
we have an integrated pest management system that does not include pesticides, and we have uh, no reason to deviate from that model as we come to Ohio. Uh, Ohio has, again, very similar um, restrictions as Illinois. A lot of the regulations were copied and pasted um, from Illinois, so. Um, yes. I, I think you said that it had a high carbon footprint, so I'd like you to talk about that, what, what uh, energy is use is resulting uh, in that, yeah. and about jobs sure. that it would provide. So I wish I had a, a better answer for you on the amount of kilowatt hours that we use at our facility a month. So it's mostly electricity? <laughs> it's mostly electricity. Okay, so we have near zero carbon footprint, 90%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Renewable. Renewable. Yep. It's great. So. Yeah, that's part of the, the, absolutely one of the best things about the greenhouse is it reduces our energy requirements, but we still do have those energy requirements, but it is primarily electricity. Okay, um, thank you. And, and then jobs. from jobs. Yeah. So jobs, uh, jobs are definitely, like I, like I said, there's two steps to participating in this program. You have to be successful in the application phase, and then you actually have to operate a company uh, after the fact. And that's a... It, this is uh, commercial agriculture, it is manufacturing, and it is pharmaceutical product formulation. That's, that's the three things that happen uh, in this facility. So uh, all of the positions, um, there's a list of positions that we'll need to fill um, to operate this company. We're not bringing uh, Illinois people to operate this facility. There will be a, a period of time um, where we do have uh, a mixed involvement. Um, part of our plan will include bringing the Ohio residents, the Ohio staff to Illinois to train on our facilities while this building is being built. It will be having Illinois people here doing, during the construction phase to oversee construction, to see receipt of equipment and instrumentation, installation, making sure everything is proofed. And there will also be a sort of cross section of time where both uh, groups are here to make sure that that transition and that implementation with standard operating procedures and doing everything the way that we've developed it, our sort of proven model in Illinois, actually gets implemented and gets ran here. And then from then on, it's more of an oversight capacity in which we manage this facility. But everybody who's working uh, on the ground, um, I would love it if, if every employee was from Yellow Springs. Uh, there's no reason for me to go outside of the community for employees. Um, that's one of the, you know, one of the great things, and again, it, wasn't, it depends on how you look at it, but Illinois had forced the geographic diversity. Uh, they carved up Illinois into 21 sections, and that's where all of these cultivated, the 21 cultivation facilities are. The, the benefit, the good thing about that is you've got facilities that are in the middle of nowhere, and it really is the largest employer uh, in, that, in that immediate area. Um, which is a phenomenal thing. And again, it's when you're talking about all of the things that these programs are intended to do, it's not just to take care of patients, it's to have a positive impact on the state. Um, so again, it, we, we've, we've seen it firsthand of the impact that, you know, a 40,000 square foot structure, um, you know, at our, right now in Illinois, we have uh, roughly 60 employees. Um, you know, to have 35, 40 employees from one area of off the beaten path Illinois, that's, that's a big thing for that community. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a great, again, sort of that level of ownership. Um, we've got great relationships with uh, local politicians and local community stakeholders. Uh, they see the benefits of what this can do. And, you know, it's definitely something that will be repeated here. Let, let's see, uh, does anybody else have any questions? I thought maybe uh, Yellow Springs being, um, we have so many nonprofits here. We have such community involvement here. Could you explain a little bit about um, how you thought that the, the staff that you hire at this facility would be involved in the community? You said about the uh, volunteer hours per quarter that you pay them for. Yeah, so in, in Illinois, one of the things that we did is for a community benefit plan is that we donate man hours. So our staff has a certain amount of hours per quarter that they're expected to do uh, community service with while they're on the clock at Cresco Labs. So. Um, we can work with the community here in developing a similar program like that. Um, it's nice to be able to deploy, you know, 30 people immediately over the first three months of this facility to work, whether it's, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 hours of community service over that quarter. Um, 
where we're funding it. Um, a lot of things can get done and a lot of good things can happen. Um, we've also done, I, I mentioned it earlier, the, the sort of revenue sharing opportunity of, uh, of working with, whether it's chosen by, you know, one of the, the things we'll want is an advisory board that's made up of community members that will, you know, there's certain disciplines that we like to have covered, like um, horticulture experience, um, manufacturing, um, food prep, certain things that are things that we do in that facility every day. We'd love to have community members be a part of an advisory board, and one of those roles is absolutely community integration. So maintaining that good relationship with the community and making sure that we're doing everything that you guys would like to see from a, 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 a big employer uh, in the community giving back, it's a priority of ours. So I think unless council or staff up here has another question, I think the easiest thing, since we only have one microphone, I think the easiest way for the, for the community discussion to go is the way we've done it several times on big topics is we'll have you come up, ask questions, make comments, we'll take notes, then we'll ask Charlie or um, uh, Troy to come up and, and answer, or if staff, it's something that staff or council can answer, we'll do that. So. Um, Council, do we have anything else we would like them to, to, we would like Charlie to address before we turn it over to the community? No, okay. Yeah, so, so, Karen, are we on a three minute timer with this? One? Yeah, we'll, we'll try to keep this at three minutes. I mean, we, there's a lot of folks here, so we'll see what we can do. Um, as usual, we just ask you to come up to the microphone, um, state your name, and again, we'll, co we'll be collecting questions and comments and then um, the folks from Cresco will respond later. So, Bill, I saw your hands up first. Thanks. Um, I'm William Firestone, Yellow Springs resident, and I would like to read to you a letter that my wife wrote, Don Johnson. She can't be here. She works during the day. I highly encourage you to ask questions of this prospective business like those asked by the sharks on Shark Tank. Because we are not just a zoning official in this case, we are in essence acting as part of the development team. These questions must be known and answered satisfactorily before we engage further. Number one, what is the total manufacturing capability in the Illinois facilities in terms of output? What are your sales relative to total capable output as a percentage? Number two, how many doctors are signed up to prescribe medical marijuana in Ohio, Illinois, Michigan? When did each state legalize? How many people? Have prescriptions, how many in Ohio, what is your projected growth, and how will it happen? Number three, how many lawsuits is Cresco involved in across the nation? What is the nature of those suits? How much is Cresco spent on litigation or mediation against other communities, against other competitors? How much is it prepared to spend in legal fees to secure market share? Number four, how many employees are employed in each Illinois facility currently? How many employees did you have at the startup? Number five, what are your current operating expenses? What are your current sales? What were your sales last year? How much capital do you have on hand? How much capital do you currently have access to? How many investors do you have? What are their shares? What is the nature of your partnership with the investors? What is the timeline payback to the investors? Could one or two or three investors back out and cause the company dire consequences? What prevents them from doing so? Number six, what measures will Cresco use to ensure no nuisances in particular, but not exclusively, odors, light pollution, excessive pesticides, noise, runoff that will recur, occur at their site. Number seven, what expenses will Cresco pay to develop and operate the site in particular but not exclusively roads, utilities, buildings, shielding, security, and lastly to council, why is the most important meeting being held when most of us are at work? Really? And my last comment is that I read a, a Chicago Tribune article from January of this year in which um, the um, CEO and, and co-founder of um, this company was asked if they had turned a profit yet, this in year four, and his answer was that in February they hoped to turn a profit. And, um, and I wonder, you know, how long it will take. It took four years in Illinois and maybe things still aren't up to speed. They had a total of maybe 13,000 people out of a market share of 130,000. That was their goal. Have a great day. Okay, so apparently there's no interest in hearing the answers to those questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, anyone else? Joe. Joe Lewis. I apologize because I have not, have not been aware of the fact that you were even considering uh, inviting someone in to um, grow medical marijuana. I guess you're aware of the fact that the Food and Drug Administration 
does not support this. They have no, they do not approve medical marijuana for treatment. Whether it's safe or not, they do not have any, uh, have not had any um, uh, field trials that I'm aware of that says it's, it's something that you even want to go into. I'm surprised that the council has not made the community more aware of what your position is before you started talking to someone out of town. I wasn't aware of it, maybe other people were. Um, along the same lines, there's a company I heard not long ago that was uh, buying land down near Wilmington, 19 acres, somewhere in Clinton County, close to the air, uh, to the air base. So uh, there's land there for sale, I guess, that people are going, may be buying for the, uh, this purpose. But um, I hear a lot of discussion about what they're doing in Illinois and, and what they've done there, what their success may be or may not be. I don't know, we haven't been there. I suppose, are you going, you have plans on uh, taking a trip out there to see what the facility is? Yes. Um, and then I guess you'll let the community know what, when you come back. Mm -hmm. They're in. Okay. Have you have you had community discussions prior to this? As to what the community we're, we're going to we're going to take all the questions. We'll answer we'll answer that after we've heard from everybody. So rather than we're you not going to tell me if you've had discussions already. Uh, actually, I addressed that in the beginning, and I said no. That that this just came up about a week ago. And we are turning around this discussion as quickly as we can. And there was surveyed. an article in the paper. We have not been soliciting. We have not solicited. We have not solicited any of these businesses. They have come to us um, because of the fact that the village doesn't have property that that had been um, that that council had had said, "Hey, we're ready to go market this property for a development." There wasn't any property with which to solicit. Where's where the property? We're talking about Joe. Okay, let let me. We'll get your questions down. I don't want to deviate from okay, the process you tell me that where we have. The have. property is. Uh, there, there are maps out on the table. Yeah. It's the CBE. It's the CBE. We're, we're, I have to um, Okay. I'll have so, other I mean, questions later. I'm yeah, sure. that's cool. That's good. I just you know but we I, just want to. I'm disappointed. Really, I'm very. Disappointed. I hear that. <coughs> Anyone else? Dave. David Turner, um, it sounds like these guys are going to buy the land and pay to connect it up and build the buildings and run their business and money will flow magically and jobs will be created. I'd like to know what specific kinds of jobs would be available uh, for people. I would like to know what um, kind of training that they would need uh, to do these jobs and what is what are they asking from Yellow Springs? in general and also if this gets going and then doesn't work after a while what are we on the hook for okay thank you um dan is he leaving too i think he's coming back okay. he's taxed over there. <laughs> um, yeah uh, dan reyes um my question is it might simply be a clarification between uh, the different things that have been put on the agenda today, but uh, the presentation by the company coming in seems to be getting ahead of the, the public business of the village in terms of uh, what the intentions are with the parcel of land uh, that's, that's uh, on, on the table, I think, in, in many ways for uh, consideration here. And uh, you haven't gotten around to discussing the legislation that you've uh, put in the packet for us, or put on the table for us today. Uh, but that's um, materially connected to this, and in some ways seems like it precedes uh, the details of who the prospective occup occupant would be, uh, particularly since this is village property at this point, and the village has, I, I presume, taken it seriously to consider what is going to be the best use of the property that's been formally known as the CBE. Uh, the legislation that you have drafted right now suggests that uh, essentially that you've exhausted uh, that question, uh, that the village has no use for that property. Your legislation uh, states directly, which I would say is a false statement because we haven't discussed it or explored it. So I'm worried about rushing ahead 
before we've considered the village's interest uh, with this property that's a valuable entry gateway property for us. And we've tried some things in the past. We've had some things proposed in the past which haven't happened, uh, but that doesn't hardly to me seems that we've exhausted uh, the question of what is the best use, what is the best way to deal with this property. Uh, if, if it's indeed annexed, it has been annexed for some years now, and if it's indeed considered part of the village, um, that's got to be part of the formula. Is, is this, um, you know, pr previously there was a suburban business park plan on the table. Uh, perhaps this is a continuation of it, although it's uh, uh, industrial, agricultural, and, and pharmaceutical at this point. Um, but there's really not an urban planning type of examination of this. How does this integrate? How does this place integrate with the village? So th that's something I'd like to see before. Uh, there's a question of what is the right contract to negotiate with a prospective user to have a clear picture for what the village wants out here. Thanks, Dan. Christine? Yeah, my name is Christine Roberts. I'm very pleased to be here. I think it's a great, great, great idea. And I hope that it can work out. Um, you know, I mean, we live in the real world. Nothing's perfect. Uh, you know, not everybody would agree with this as a product, but uh, I think there's a lot of uh, evidence that, uh, that uh, this is a safe product. I mean, I think it's true no one has ever died from marijuana overdose. Uh, there's, you know, it, there's, it, you can go on and on with that. Um, <clears throat> my, my question is, is pretty base. Uh, I haven't had time to really study the issue uh, and the pros and cons. Uh, you know, we were, I, I worry about uh, the, um, the taking from the many and giving to the rich economic development theories. Uh, in other words, I wonder how much of our tax money is going to be drained off in order to support the business in its infancy and what kind of a timeline there might be for a payback for that. Now, uh, I, don't, I did not hear specifically who was going to pay for the road to get in there. And that would be my number one question, a very baseline question, who pays for the road in. Um, Besides that, it's just a matter of what, what, do, what do we pay for as citizens and what can we really get back uh, in, what can we see in, in yeah, you know, it, it's hard to see the future and know for sure, but it would be nice to have some better idea of what's coming back to us. And, um, you know, I, I just want to say real quick about, uh, you know, you can come in with a beautiful idea, like Ultracell had a new idea for energy and he, they got a big, uh, grant from the Third Frontier. They established themselves in Dayton with a lot of um, with a lot of uh, promises. And uh, when you say a forty thousand dollar average salary, I can tell you uh, they promised uh, hundreds of jobs. Uh, they only produced a dozen jobs. They were all minimum wage jobs, except for the uh, CEOs who had three figure salaries. And they drained down that uh, Third Frontier grant. Uh, and uh, if you average a, a three, a, a, you know, a, you have a very high wages for your, if you do the average between the high wage for the CEO and the minimum wage for the, for the workers, you could possibly get a $40,000 average, but that doesn't mean that most people are getting 40000 So I, I just think we need to be clear on some of these issues. And I, I, I think that Bill will get his questions to you, and I think, we, I think he just figured you can't get all those answers in one right. session. So I, I think he asked good questions. And I want to thank you again for having this, and for, I want to thank the people that have brought this to our town. Uh, I, I, I want to thank you very much for coming and for selecting us. I hope it can work out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank thanks, you. Christine. Anyone else? Whoops, sorry. Can't stop um, Carl. Starts. It's lovely, Judy. Mm. <laughs> it's very soothing. <laughs> yes, I'm Carl Champney, and uh, okay, I just just has mm -hmm. to do its thing. Sorry. Okay, yeah. Carl Champney. I also I I think it's a good idea, certainly a good idea to consider. I appreciate the presentation. Um, sounds like you are planning to look at these facilities or whatever in Illinois. I would stress also. If you haven't already, ask the community how it works for them from that end of it, mm -hmm. whether the, about any of the light issues or anything mm -hmm. like that, for instance. Also, uh, 
I would want to know what effect it might have on other businesses that might go into the CBE as well as the businesses that exist around there. For instance, the doctor businesses. Now you may have talked to them already because you say you have done a lot of that outreach. Uh, then also I'll reiterate a concern I think Dave brought up about what arrangements might be in place in case the land reverts and something happens where it be on a national level or whatever where this isn't viable whether the village would still maintain some control over that land or maybe that's the zoning I don't know those are my okay concerns. thanks Carl anyone else Rick and I'm a citizen and I thought I was an adjacent property owner. Um, Mary and I have uh, 40 acres across the street from the CBE. Um, <clears throat> maybe you met right up against like a uh, farm or something like that. <clears throat> we are adjacent to the CBE. And I, I would look very favorably on this. It sounds like um, I'm a farmer myself, farm commercial peppermint for a quarter of a century. It was a new product at the time, a new crop where we were at the time. It takes a lot of guts to come in and do something like what these people are doing. And um, I see the glass is half full on this. I see it um, jobs. <clears throat> and I think we all have to settle for the fact that the CBE is going to be something. It's not going to go away. And um, here it is. And so let's Let's make a good thing of it, and I think this is a good start. Um, I'm not afraid of it impacting our property, uh, with which we have quite an investment there. <laughs> um, w one thing I would like to, to put forth is that <clears throat> this would be the first piece of property selling out of the CBE, and my concern with the CBE has always been retail. I don't want retail out there because I think it would negatively affect our downtown like it has so many other downtowns and I think if you put deed restrictions prohibiting retail on this six acres it would be a good start and set a good good example for the rest of the CB and, and take a lot of the anxiety out of the CBE which there has been for so many of us. Um, but anyway I, I wish these guys luck and um, if I can do anything to help, I'd be glad to. Thanks, Rick. Chrissy? I'm Chrissy Cruz, and first of all, I want to say thank you to Council and Patty and Lisa for jumping on this. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, I, I've thought that for a while, that this would be a good fit for the community. Um, it's medicinal marijuana, which we are, um, I've, talked with community solutions we're working on focusing is Yellow Springs being a community of wellness and so how could it not be a good fit and the only two questions that I had really is will the company itself be paying for I guess like Christine said the road the infrastructure and then how long would it be from the time say the deal was set in place about how long would it be before production would start so that's okay good. thanks anyone else Dorothy? <coughs> Hi, I'm mostly uh, in favor of this Can project. you state your name? Yes, Dorothy Bouquet. Uh, I think it's a great proposal to look at. I can see why you guys are excited about it. Uh, I'm mostly worried about the timeline of this because this is dictated by the end of June deadline by which uh, this company needs to make an application. Are you going to have enough time to consider all of the in and outs of this deal? Uh, are you going to have enough time to get the figure and see uh, what type of jobs are going to be created uh, to go and visit the communities and look at the impacts on the communities? There's just there are so many questions here, and I'm worried that it's going a little bit too fast. And then, if you know, if this is going too fast, what are you guys ready to let go of in terms of? information that you're waiting for to make a decision so thank you thanks Matt I saw you yes, yes. as quick 
if I can. Uh, I grew up here. My family goes back three Just generations. Say your name. Matthew McNelly, I'm sorry. I live in Cedarville. But I want to know about impact of Green County, Ohio, townships, et cetera, et cetera, how this will affect things outside of the community, how that's going to be dealt with. In particular, do you already have relationships in Ohio with lawyers, law firms, banks, investors, special interests? Can people uh, invest locally? And again, cottage industry-wise, I, I see potential in that, but I'm neutral on the whole thing. I have no say what goes on in the village anymore. I'd also, you addressed it sort of in uh, stormwater runoff, which there would be a runoff minimal. It's supposed to evaporate, but I would like to know how it impacts the sewer, uh, the waste stream, and will there be composting on the property? That's a big one. That's a big one. Um, anyone else? Dave? Well, wait, Dave, hold on. Um, Matthew? Matthew Kirk? We'll get somebody who hasn't spoken yet. So I guess I have a, a couple things, you know. Uh, part of the significant risk of a project like this is, you know, the, the track that Ohio has taken uh, with respect to medical marijuana going a highly regulated, uh, high, high cost regulatory type of approach. Um, so one of my questions would be, you know, how does the company respond if the environment changes uh, politically where more companies are able to enter into the fold? Uh, I think the question about utilities is an important one, figuring out um, who's going to pay for it. Um, because as it relates to uh, going concerned with the business, uh, whether we'd be on the hook for that as a, a debt function or not. Um, you know, I, I, one thing I want to talk about with Ohio's particular uh, program is that, and wonder how it relates to Illinois, is whether or not Illinois allows you to buy smokable product. Because I believe in Ohio, you're only able to buy uh, things that are either vaporized or edibles, which are not the way that most people consume things. So that may have uh, some delay to customer acquisition. Um, and I guess the, the bigger question I have for the, the village at large when they're looking at this project is, if we do want to go down this right, do, go down this path, you know, the some companies may not want to locate next to a medicinal marijuana grow, growth company. That may not fit with their business planning model. So thinking about how does that impact the other sites that are still available at the CBE, and whether or not it's prudent or makes sense to if we are going to go down this path to say welcome all comers right now is a period of time where there are, like you said hundreds of applicants all across the state as many of those as we can get put yellow springs down as their preferred location which let's be honest i think we have a great regional brand as it relates to a lot of things that appeal to people that are going to be medicinal marijuana users we have the opportunity to become an actual tourist type of destination uh, similar to what we have now but people travel to buy marijuana every day of the year, not just on nice days and in the summer. So this is a way we can bolster some of our existing economy as well. Um, so just consider those approaches, especially when selling a parcel of land. I see how this is done here. I'm assuming that's because it has to be far away from the church. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, possibly reorienting that so you can have multiple sites that where you could have growth facilities that would be located at the back of the site may make more sense, right? If our ultimate goal is to fully embrace this industry. So just keeping our options open. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks. Anyone else? Anything else? Um, David. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Dave. I would like to try to die from marijuana use, but um, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> only you, Dave. <laughs> I haven't tried for a long time. Um, I, just, I just do some rough calculations. I'm also curious as to about what kind of income the village would get from that. My calculations show that if there are 30 jobs at $40,000 a year, that's about 18000 in income tax and 12000 in school tax. I'd take that money, but it's not a whole lot. Even if it's 40 jobs at 40000 a year, that only bumps it up to 24000 for the village and, and 16000 for the school. How much more money do we get out of this is a mm -hmm. general question. Anything else? Um, Liz, you guys notice that I've known every person yeah. who's come up here? <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Liz Robertson here. I'm a resident. And I want to thank you for um, thinking to ask a lot of the questions that we've already had. Um, 
public concerns, environmental concerns, and that type of thing. I think the one question I'm still wondering is why Yellow Springs? Why did they choose Yellow Springs originally? What factors do we have here that were that made us stand out from any other place in the world? Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Christine? Yeah. Um, I'm also curious about the trucking. Uh, obviously, this is a small product, so you can fit a lot in a truck, I guess. But uh, trucking creates trouble, and mm -hmm. we're not close to an interstate. Um, okay. Anyone else? I, I think I'm going to, I want to answer, I, I think that the ones that um, I can answer, um, Mr. Lewis is, you know, expressed concern, frustration, and, and uh, disappointment in our lack of communication with the community. Yeah, I, I tried to explain that in the beginning. I mean, this is, this is happening, and, and I feel that as if we're responding as, as quickly as we can. Um, when I bring Charlie up here again, I'm going to ask him to, to go through the, the state process and why this, this is so quick. Um, so I apologize, and, I, and you know, it's our intent to do everything we can to have as many meetings. I expect that we will be having other public meetings, other special meetings, other extra meetings. I don't want you also to forget about the fact that next week on May 30th, we have the interviews for the, uh, meeting the, the chief candidates. So that's another thing that we have in the middle of this that's, that's in extremely important that is another special meeting. Um, I, I mean, there, there is nothing I can do except say we're trying to respond as quickly as we can. This, this time frame was, was given to us, and it's not something that we're setting ourselves. Um, I did say we, we are not seeking, we did not seek any of these um, businesses. We're responding to opportunities. We're responding to things that were, were presented to us. Um, I think, I mean, Christine was really one of the first people when we were talking about um, the development of that property and just opportunities for Yellow Springs that the idea of medical marijuana seemed like a, a, a relatively obvious one for this community and and I have to bump it over to Chrissy Cruz. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were the one who brought the newspaper. Uh, yeah, but that was actual money for it is when I brought it. Right. Down. But but you know it, it again you know and and as far as and, and and to Dan's questions about the process about the design process the use process um, you know, we, we had started that. We have a second meeting. We had one meeting. We have another meeting scheduled. We have started the community conversation. It's, it's not a surprise to me, and it was actually an expectation that this kind of scenario is what would present itself, is that we would be presented with an opportunity that we had to respond to, and that's what we're doing. Um, in, in the due diligence that we've done with our attorney, with counsel, um, with other folks in the community, this looks like a great opportunity. Um, it doesn't look like it will be a detriment to the Center for Business and Education. I think that, that um, you know, it's a question we did ask. Will this have a, a negative effect on other businesses? Um, I, you know, I don't know. But you know what? This is the first opportunity that's presented itself to us in 10 or 15 years. And it is something that I think we, we, need, to, we need to pursue. I think it, it brings an opportunity. I love the fact that, it has, that it's agriculturally based, which is an important thing in this community. It's food based, based and it's health based. I mean, to, that, those are three of the values, the tenets of this community. And I think that that, that is really compelling to me. Um, I'm trying to think of what else we could answer. Well, well, you're, yeah. Can I say something? Sure, go. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're thinking away. Yeah. Um, you, you started off, Karen, I think, by apologizing, I guess. And I would just like to say, I, I don't think we need to apologize for anything. Life happens. Uh, you know, and if, if we had the ideal world exactly at we, as we wanted it, maybe in 10 years or so, we'd have a, a plan that located every single business that we wanted there, or we weren't going to have, or, or, or whatever, perhaps maybe in 10 years. So far, it's been about 12 years, and nothing's happened there except Antioch University of Midwest. So I mean, when life happens and an opportunity arises, it seems to me like you try to take advantage of it. And that's what we're doing. And I think that 
council and staff <laughs> have been working as hard as they can uh, on getting the information and we've been communicating out to the public, um, getting questions, getting responses. I mean, we're in the middle of it, so um, I don't think we need to apologize for anything. And, and I'd like to say, you know, Karen's president of councils, so she makes the presentation to the public. And, and as we know, no more than two council members can, can meet with folks at one time or we're accused of collusion or, or whatever. But, and I'm speaking for myself now, um, I had a chance once I found about uh, the, the prospect of a new business coming. I've, I've done research. I've met with the two gentlemen uh, from Cresco. Uh, I've also been talking to folks in the community. That's why Joe's here. <laughs> I happened to see Joe at the doctor's office and, and told him what was going on. Of course, he didn't know about it, but uh, trying to contact folks. I personally have been around my neighborhood. I've talked to folks in the neighborhood, talked to folks in the community. I've talked to doctors outside of the community in, in terms of medical marijuana, where it may be going and so forth. And uh, I was kind of like Dan at first until I looked at the map. And no, we're not giving away or proposing to sell all 40 some acres of the CBE. The company has come to us with a specific proposal on the amount of land that they need to use and so forth. So to me, that gives us ample opportunity to sit down and look at the other 38 acres uh, of the CBE. And as I've talked to folks about this particular uh, adventure or proposal, whatever you want to call it, they have suggested other types of industry that may be similar to what these folks are proposing. To, to come in to see to the uh, land formerly known as the CBE. <laughs> so to me, this is getting us to where we want it to be 10 years ago. And when we had the referendum on not doing anything, you know, number one, there was always that cry of, if you build it, they will come. Now we got someone that says, I'm coming and I'm going to build. Number two, we had cries saying, not my money, you bring your own money. So what I've heard so far is they're bringing their own money. And number three, there's still something available for someone else. So, you know, it's an opportunity. And the other thing that I always think about, people start businesses every day. Some businesses make it and some business fail. Okay? If we sat down and made every business that wanted to do business in Yellow Springs to come in and lay out a 10, 15, 20 year plan and we worry about whether they're going to make it or not, We'll never get anywhere. If you look at downtown Yellow Springs, on Dayton Street alone, how many businesses has come, have come and gone? We haven't questioned any of them. It seems like someone comes in and fills their place. Okay? Um, so one question I do want to answer just right off the top is uh, we've learned that starting salary is $14 an hour. So, um, and I'm going to let Charlie answer a lot of these other questions. But I want to emphasize in particular, besides the fact that this hits so many of the issues that we've been talking about, and, you know, I love what Mary Ann said. I mean, again, you know, how could we not explore this opportunity? I mean, you, sh you know, this is our responsibility as a village and council members. But what really gets me excited is the community engagement piece 
And one of the things that's so important to Cresco is the idea of uh, this acceptance from the community, which in general I'm starting to feel, and I think most people are getting uh, how uh, amazing this can be. So what I hope happens next is that we start to creatively think about how this revenue can really address things in our community. Uh, these guys are, you know, I met with a lot of stakeholders already. They're going to be meeting with our nonprofits, and I want to really think about what things are going to make sense that are going to improve affordability, that are going to make our community better. And uh, yeah, I'm super excited. I mean, this this is something that, wow. I mean, who would have thought this was going to come? And uh, again, I'll, I'll let these guys answer some of those specific questions. And I think the only other thing I will address is the due diligence piece related to Illinois. I spoke with um, chamber officials. Again, everything was positive there. Patty spoke with, I think, Juliet officials. We aren't done with that. We still will do more. We'll do site visits. So there's more to come on that. But um, uh, so, so all of the questions that were, were, there were a lot of questions asked. I think, I think that there are a few things that we come down to. It, it's, it's explaining the Ohio process, the, the Ohio time frame, Charlie explaining um, um, kind of what does potentially happen at the end of the day if, if the regulations change. If, if we have a new administration come in and Ohio decides we're not going to do this at all, um, or the likelihood of that. I mean, I've, I heard a lot of insurance people say that the ACA would never go away. and. You know, hopefully it still won't, but we, we don't know. So that, and let's see what else. Um, I think that that, that those, that those kind of cover a lot of this kind of general thing that people were asking. And then there was that piece about timeline. Timeline, yes, about, yes, um, you're right, timeline. And types of jobs. So I'll start with, uh, is it okay if I start with types of jobs? Yeah. I sort of wrote down the questions as, they were, okay. as best I could. Um, types of jobs. So this facility, again, um, it, it's, it's agriculture, it's, uh, it's manufacturing, and it's, it's ph pharmaceutical product formulation. So the types of jobs that are associated with that, I would consider an entry-level job at our facilities in Illinois as that sort of gardener um, maintenance uh, position. And again, as, as Brian said, um, we made a commitment in Illinois, which I'm, you know, would be comfortable developing with uh, the community here too of, of every position at uh, the, the lowest level position entry level position start at fourteen dollars an hour um, from there you have team lead positions you have more senior uh, gardeners and, and maintenance and when I say maintenance I mean plant maintenance not um, necessary uh, necessarily custodians uh, we actually outsource the cleaning of our facility for a variety of reasons but including commercial grade cleaning of the facility but um, so plant maintenance um, you have team leads, you have extraction technicians, you have uh, all the way up to the director of cultivation and the director of extraction and formulation. And, you know, for example, our director of cultivation for our company, who will basically oversee the director of cultivation here, uh, he has an undergrad degree in agronomy and a master's in horticultural sciences from K-State. He's basically a scientist that has been in the cannabis space now for 11 years. So it's a very... It's a technical approach mixed with uh, hands-on cannabis experience, and those two, uh, you'd be surprised at how, um, it, it, how difficult it is to find both of those in one person at this stage. It's something that will, I refer to him as a unicorn, um, it's something that will be more common as the industry develops, but right now it's very rare. Um, and same with the director of our extraction and formulation lab, she's a molecular biochemist. Um, has 14 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry. So. Uh, Every position in between um, is at this facility, and they do range from $14 an hour to, you know, those directors are six-figure positions. Um, of course, uh, everything that goes along with that is there's trimming, there's packaging, there's logistics, there's delivery. All of those things are also our responsibility in the facility. Um, what was next on that list? Um, just, just talking about why we're why we're forced into this oh, the for shortened timeline. So, um, one of the things that Ohio did that was a little unique is they actually they started the application window. They gave us the time frame for applications uh, prior to the issuing and publishing of the final rules, and uh, that's something I've you know I've I've looked at um, probably 
I don't know, six or seven different state programs around the country. I've never seen that scenario where they actually issue the application uh, questions, what they're looking for, and what date they want those turned in at um, before they issue the final rules. And I would also say that even the feedback that we had gotten from Department of Commerce leading up to that was you'll get the final rules on May 5th, and at that time we'll give you more information about the application process. So uh, to a certain extent, they kind of started the clock on us a little early. Um, and that is a, that's a deadline. Um, so applications for our level of facility, again, there's 12 uh, larger scale and 12 smaller scales. The 12 smaller scales, I think, are June 15th. So it's even a shorter window. And then the uh, larger scale facilities is June 30th. Um, and, and that is, that's when we have to turn in a, a full application that explains to them exactly what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, um, and where we're going to do it. So that time frame was sort of, we've, we forced extend, upon you. Uh, and then will you extend beyond that to address the sort of when we can Construction. Submit sure, so application yeah. submitted end of June. Um, states are, they vary on how long it takes them. Uh, Maryland, for example, took almost, uh, I don't know, it was nine months, ten months to um, uh, give winners uh, the, the, the results. Um, I think Ohio is committed to a 90-day-ish time frame. So um, you're looking at September. I. I don't know if they'll hit that time frame or not, but I could tell you that Ohio has been uh, pretty consistently on, I mean, like I said, they were early uh, with the application launch. So um, yeah, late September, I would imagine. Uh, from that, so if we find out that we do get one of the licenses, um, at that point we'll do um, prep work, reasonable prep work leading up to that with our fingers crossed that we'll be successful. So when it comes to plans, drawings, everything to get ready for even submitting for uh, building permits we'll do in advance so we try to get as close to being shovel ready on day two as we possibly can be um, and again this is it's not our first time building this exact uh, facility for for better or worse so um, we do have some experience in in doing that um, if we uh, put shovel in the ground day two I would I would uh, we have to do it within nine months we have to be operational deemed operational within nine months I can tell you in Illinois it was six months and we built three buildings within a six-month period. Um, there, were, there were things that we did to make sure that we complied while we might not have been full, um, turn the lights on across the entire uh, facility ready. We were operational uh, within nine months. Um, within six months, I mean, within six months in Illinois, within nine months, we expect this process to take probably six months from, from first shovel growing in the ground to when we are fully operational um, for phase one growth. Um, so that put you in you know, maybe uh, March of uh, 2018, and then the life cycle of this plan, that's when we become operational. I don't know, life cycle of the plan is about 120 days. Um, so where we would actually have first harvest and first deliveries leaving the facility would be probably about 150 days after that. Okay. Question back there. Well, I'd like to come up and just say something about the timeline for a second, if I may. Uh, Chris Connor, the village solicitor, uh, I can tell you that dating back to the summer of 2015, when the uh, the, the uh, ballot proposals were on to legalize marijuana, that there was terror in the hearts of Columbus that that might happen. And as a result of that, there were some initiatives that were taken by the legislature. That meant that there was a concept in place, but the groundwork on how this was going to be put into to implement wasn't there. I can tell you I've been to countless legal seminars throughout the state. In fact, I'm part of a presentation tonight that I can't go to, but it was uh, through the Dayton Bar Association. So there's been an ongoing discussion throughout the state about how this process is going to be implemented. Um, and, uh, and so I, because of that, there's been uncertainty with the, the law directors of communities, with the, the elected officials, uh, with individuals who want to invest in medical marijuana. So uh, it's not a perfect process, but I, I think that uh, it's working out uh, pretty well by, by all accounts. Um, I do have one question that I think would be helpful to explain, uh, if you would. Um, there are multiple licenses. There's a cultivation license, there's a processing license, there's a dispensary, i.e. Com com uh, comparable to a pharmacy license, and then there are laboratories that will test the product that is going to the ultimate uh, patient who's using the medical marijuana. Uh, if you would explain what the difference is between cultivation and processing, it's my understanding that Cresco is actually looking at getting both licenses to operate out of the facility that it ultimately would build if awarded a license. 
yes, there, there are those four license types. Uh, there's cultivation, there's processing, and there's the dispensary, which is the retail uh, storefronts. Um, we will be pursuing uh, all three. Um, we haven't gotten into the dispensary uh, application. Another unique thing that Ohio did is they've actually um, they've, they've done these uh, processes independently. Um, so of course cultivation needs to happen first. They're, they're really acting on an expedited timeline here. Uh, otherwise they would have fully developed um, cultivation processing and dispensary rules, come up with the process for the application. Every other state that I've seen has had one application process where you apply for whatever of those licenses you want. So uh, Ohio is a little unique in separating those and doing cultivation first and then followed by processing and uh, the, the dispensing licenses. We'll be applying for cultivation. We eventually will be applying for processing and, and the retail dispensaries as well. Um, it, it is unique to, again, with that time frame being separate, um, we will operate under the assumption that we will be successful in both cultivation and processing. If we're going to be successful in cultivation, we expect to also be successful in processing. Um, those two those two processes go uh, hand in hand. I mean, it is, it's going from one side of the facility to the other, so we will design the facility to, be, uh, to, to handle both. When it comes to dispensing, um, we haven't focused on where or um, uh, we would be looking to do that. Traditionally, dispensaries tend to follow um, uh, larger uh, population areas. Um, cultivation centers will usually, they, they're fine dispersing that across the state regardless of population, but dispensaries, you know, traditionally are around where the majority of patients are, but um, we haven't evaluated for Yellow Springs if this is a appropriate, if, if that's something that the community would want or not. We're not even, we're not really, uh, we're not focusing on dispensary process at all at this point. This is purely cultivation and processing for us. Um, was there another uh, aspect of testing? Um, the yeah. testing license, um, that's critical, and that's definitely one of the you know, more significant components of the Generation 2 program is um, very restrictive testing requirements. It is what separates, it's one of the things that separates um, licensed medical cannabis from, um, from street cannabis, um, the fact that uh, we have very uh, controlled growing environments that have to be uh, utilized to make sure that this will pass what the state wants and really what those independent third-party lab tests um, will show. They'll test for uh, potency. They'll test for to make sure that there's no microbial contamination. Uh, they'll test for residual pesticides, um, and they'll test for residual solvents on any processed material. So when a, when a patient, you know, I mean, you have to think this, this program is designed for individuals that are sick that have compromised immune systems. Uh, they need to be able to look at that product and see that this has gone through an independent third-party lab test and shows that there are no microbial contaminations, no residual solvents, and that it has exactly X percent THC, Y percent CBD. Um, the goal is to make this as um, true to traditional uh, medicines as you can with an agricultural uh, biological product. I want to take one of the comments you just made and, and then address something that Rick Donahoe asked um, related to deed restrictions. There are covenants on this property that, that do not allow retail. Um, he just mentioned the retail dispensary portion. By law, they're not allowed to put that retail dispensary portion as part of this facility, if, as part of the production facility. Um, you know, if they would, it, it's not something that's been raised to us at all by them or anybody else about putting a retail distribution um, here. Um, again, I, I, I'd say it's probably something that would be considered, but but um, from from the from the uh, from the tax base, from the standpoint of revenue for the village of Yellow Springs, it certainly not, doesn't bring the revenue that would be as of as great of interest to us because there aren't as many jobs and they're essentially retail sales jobs. So, um, so and and I don't know that we want more tourism in Yellow Springs, Matthew. So um, we hear about it a lot. Um, so. Um, 
I just wanted to say it, that, that that is something that's really followed the CBE, followed that property, and has been a concern um, related to retail, related to anything that would harm downtown, and that just simply isn't, isn't allowed, and it isn't anything that council has ever discussed wanting to be there. Mm -hmm. um, where else, what else do we uh, have? Are we talking about infrastructure? Infrastructure, sure, and then okay. composting and trucking. Oh, the compo would you talk about the composting? Because that was interesting too, Charlie. Sure. So every, every gram that's uh, grown in this facility truly has to be tracked from seed to sale, so even waste. Um, once a product's been broken down for harvest, um, there's definitely a, you know, a big, we don't, um, we don't currently extract from uh, stems or even fan leaves. Um, there's, uh, again, with the, with the beginning stages of Illinois, and one of the gentlemen said that the program's been going on for four years. We, we passed our law four years ago. The program in Illinois has been live for about 16 months. Um, so at this stage, we're still able to produce more than demand is. There's been a slow ramp up period in Illinois and that's um, uh, for a variety of reasons. But uh, one of the things of when it comes to tracking everything from seed to sale is measuring and weighing out your waste material because it needs to be tracked all along that life cycle from harvest as a wet weight all the way through what makes it into processing and what goes into um, disposal. And the disposal process in Illinois, it's similar to here. Um, I think it's word for word that it needs to be uh, rendered unidentifiable by mixing it with at least 51% of some other material. Um, so it's unusable and unrecognizable. And then it can be composted. So in Illinois, um, we do compost on our site. Um, we'll have to clarify exactly what Ohio wants to see when it comes to the ability to use that compost. But that was something that council had brought up as potential um, synergies with the local, um, with the local business with being able to compost that uh, our waste material. And, and when talk about the traffic, talk about trucks, deliveries, that kind of thing. There's not a ton. I mean, it really the the, the primary uh, road traffic will be from employees. I mean, we have in Joliet, we have 35 cars in our parking lot every day. So it's it's really uh, commuting traffic. Um, somebody had mentioned earlier about. Uh, bike to work incentives, which I think would be a fantastic thing. It, our facilities in Joliet and Kankakee and Lincoln are, they would be tremendous bike rides for, for the <laughs> employee. They're not, they're not close to residences, but um, uh, it's mainly uh, the commuting traffic of employees. And I would say on average, maybe we have three to four deliveries a day. Um, and it's soil, it's uh, CO2 canisters, it's not, it's not flatbed semis. Um, our delivery vehicles are sprinter vans. Um, so, you know, just traditional commercial uh, vehicles, uh, nothing of significant size. Um, and they come and go, you know, once in the morning and they come back at night. Um, but not a ton of traffic. And not heavy traffic. And one thing we learned, since Charlie brought it up, is in those 16 months, um, Illinois has... Uh, oh, and we are profitable. So that, that article he mentioned from right. January, April. So thank you very much. We're very <laughs> excited to right. no longer be burning money. Uh, and you mentioned um, uh, in that 16-month period that 20,000 uh, clients now or customers have been generated, of which Cresco has 22% of that uh, market share. Um, part of what uh, we heard, which I thought was very compelling, was the importance of education, both to physicians and to, uh, um, to patients in understanding the benefits for their conditions. Um, but I do think we should talk about, because um, we've kind of danced around it, but your commitment related to the infrastructure piece, because that is an important part of this. And We'll cover the cost of the infrastructure improvements. I, that was a... The road. I, we, we're getting bids. We need to have a better understanding of what this really costs. But it sounds like the bids that the uh, village had had before, I have to imagine, um, will be able to get a better um, price on that. It seems significantly higher than what we've paid for before to drag utilities, you know, about 750 feet. So um, it's something that we'll build into this that it'll be part of, of the cost of, of uh, acquisition for us. Right. Which answers, I think, a big issue. Um, but also on the villages end, we're exploring uh, grants that are available from ODOT um, for uh, roads that lead to jobs. Um, so, you know, we're also doing our part of this uh, to make it work. 
And, and it will be, the intent will be that, that we'll work with them um, on the engineering so that it, whatever is put in, in terms of infrastructure, will facilitate the development of the rest of the, of the property. So, um, you know, it, I, I've heard some people say, well, this isn't a very big employer. It's, it's, it's a very big opportunity. And, and this is the way they come in a small community like this. This is the way they come. And, and this is the way industry is going anyway, into smaller companies. I think it's the kind of facility, the kind of employer we would want, smaller but um, robust and, and, and really looking um, kind of on the leading edge. But in, in one to, kind of starts the ball rolling. And sorry to interrupt on no. that. And I do, I'd want to add clarification, too, when it comes to those job numbers. Um, I've heard of other companies that are, are uh, in the media here in Ohio talking about the size of the facilities that they're going to build, uh, how much they're going to cost, and how many people they'll employ. Um, that's a fully, uh, you know, the number, first of all, is, is way bigger than a facility would actually ever be in Ohio. You're going to be capped per the current law at 75,000 square feet of cultivation no matter what. So I don't know why anybody would necessarily have a 300,000 plus square foot facility if you only have 75,000 square feet of cultivation. But um, the first phase that you're allowed to do is 25,000 square feet of cultivation. And I think we went over it earlier, but there's kind of a one-to-one -one ratio for a square foot of cultivation, you need just about another square foot of non-cultivation area to make sure that you're all the ancillary services that go into preparing a product for sale. So phase one of this will allow us to have a total of 25,000 square feet of cultivation, so about a 50,000 square foot building. I mean, the number that we mentioned earlier was around 30 people to start. Um, once that first phase is fully built out, that's more like 60 to 65 full-time employees. If you expand from 25 to 50,000 square feet, which you have the right to do come September of 18, if patient demand requires it, that'll be another, I would say probably another uh, 35 full-time employees, 40 full-time employees. And if you're able to expand then from 50 to 75, the following year, should patient demand require it, you're talking about another 35 to 40 full-time employees. So fully built out, um, this facility could be about 150,000 square feet with roughly 125 full-time employees, give or take. So, um, you know. In the same eight acres as your product? Yeah, that's why we're doing the eight acres. So, I mean, that footprint of 150,000 square foot building is, you know, shy of four acres you same almost same ratio you know for parking and for perimeter um, that's why we're doing an eight acre parcel and and the idea of um, you know politicians being being fickle and changing their minds um, and one thing that that I know I'm going to do and I expect Brian will do also and maybe other council members is reach out to our local elected or our state elected officials find out what their pulse is we may very well have the next governor that is used to be a resident of Yellow Springs. We don't know. Um, but, you know, we, we have people we can reach out to to kind of get the pulse of where state officials are feeling about this. But if, if something does change, I mean, you know, perhaps it actually becomes more, distribution becomes more liberal. I, I you know, sure. I mean, what, what would your response be to, yeah. to either scenario? So, you know, there's, there's, um, there's business impacts on any of those changes, right? You, you design this with the information that you have in front of you at the time. Um, so as designed, um, as, as structured from a legislative standpoint, this is how we've built this, um, the expected growth of this, this project plan. Um, I've yet to see, there's one example of a state going backwards with regard to medical cannabis, and that's Montana, if I remember correctly. Um, definitely not a generation two uh, medical cannabis program. It was, it, was a, it was a pretty tried and true generation one program. So it wasn't compliance focused, it wasn't highly regulated, it wasn't controlled at all. Um, I, I've yet to see, um, again, we haven't had a, a failure of a program other than Montana. Um, if they do issue more licenses, um, it's one of the reasons, they've, they've actually, and again, uh, you know, regime changes can occur. Um, but I think it, it's on the operators that are part of this program to ensure that this program is operating as good as it can as it's designed. Because if it's operating as good as it can as it's designed, there's no reason to make a change to it. Um, if it's not fully performing to the best of its ability, that's when changes would be recommended. 
Um, I could see them, that's uh, something that we're evaluating in Illinois, um, expanding the amount of retail um, facilities because, you know, s Illinois, and this is where I think Ohio, again, another example of Ohio doing what Illinois did, we both have 60 dispensary licenses. So in states of 11 million plus and 13 million plus residents, you can make an argument that 60 stores in that entire state isn't enough. Um, that's not great enough access for people. People shouldn't have to drive an hour and 15 minutes to go to their nearest dispensary. So I think it, Illinois is already evaluating potentially expanding the number of retail outlets that are available just to increase access. Um, but on the cultivation side, we've yet to outgrow our capabilities. And if you do the math on what 12 large facilities with 75,000 square feet of cultivation capability is, that's a lot of production capability. So uh, Ohio would have to have a, a, an incredibly robust medical cannabis program to require more supply. So, so I want to also, again, emphasize, you know, again, this has all happened very quickly. We're still discussing and negotiating, but I do think even uh, uh, Bill and Don's laundry list of questions, a lot of them have already been answered. Um, but one of the things that the Cresco team has been very frank about is being open in terms of projections. And so all those very detailed things about what's going to happen every month or whatever, um, they can address those as well. But I guess I'd like to recommend that maybe we look at the yeah we we, we, have, we have been going for yeah, a while. We do have a piece of legislation in front of us. Um, it was mentioned. We do have a piece of legislation. Um, I think what I'm going to do is go ahead and have Judy read the legislation and we'll make a motion. We'll do the whole thing, read it in in full, and then I'm going to bring the solicitor up to talk about it. Okay, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into negotiations regarding the potential sale of village owned property. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs Village owns real property, the property described as follows, as follows, situate in the village of Yellow Springs, County of Green and State of Ohio, and being lots numbered one, two, and three of Center for Business and Education, as recorded in Platt Cabinet 38, pages 78A through 79A of the Platt Records of Green County, Ohio, parcel number F19-1-20-3, lot one, parcel number F19-1-20-6, lot two, Parcel number F19-1-20-7, lot 3. And whereas the voters of the state of Ohio approved the cultivation, processing, and dispensing of marijuana for medical purposes, and the state of Ohio is now accepting third-party applications to obtain licenses to cultivate and process medical marijuana, and whereas the village has been appro approached by Cresco Labs Ohio LLC, Cresco, to purchase a portion of the property to cultivate and process marijuana for med medicinal use, and whereas Village Council has, has determined that it is in the village's best interest to engage in discussions with Cresco for the purpose of selling village-owned real estate for the cultivation and processing of medical marijuana, and whereas Village Council has determined the property is not needed for any municipal purpose, and whereas Village Council desires to authorize the village manager to enter into negotiations with Cresco for the sale of a portion of the property for the purpose of producing medical marijuana. Now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, Village Council hereby authorizes the village manager to enter into negotiations with Cresco for the sale of a portion of the property for the purpose of cultivating and or processing marijuana for medicinal purposes. Section 2, the village manager is hereby further authorized to enter into a non-binding letter of intent with Cresco attached here to as Exhibit A in the same or substantially similar form. Section 3, this resolution shall become effective immediately upon its adoption. Thanks, Judy. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, Chris, <coughs> can you come up and or Okay. Uh, okay, let me first address something that, that, that uh, a question that Dan raised, which is a uh, language that's contained in the resolution that has to do with uh, the village council has determined the property is not needed for any municipal purpose. That's a requirement that, that state law has because, uh, for example, we wouldn't want the elected officials to offer city hall for sale when it's being a property that's being used. CBE land was always acquired with the intention that it would be used for economic development of some kind, and so that's a requirement the council would have to make a finding that the property is not being used for a specific municipal purpose. And Chris, is it specific to this plot that we're talking about as well? Well, in a, in a broad sense, in the context of this legislation, it's the entire CBE because at this point we're still identifying that lot. We've got a sense of where it is. Mm -hmm. That's why for purposes of the resolution, 
it says it's identified the entire CBE parcel, but that's not the intention as it goes forward when there's actually a contract for sale of land when that, if we ever get to that place. Um, all the resolution does is manifest in a, a public intent and in compliance with Sunshine Laws uh, to be transparent that there are going to be active negotiations between the Village of Yellow Springs and Cresco for the purposes of potentially selling municipal or uh, village-owned land. The letter of intent, as you've heard, is a non-binding letter of intent. That's a standard tool that's used in any business transaction. And if you think about this, the fact that the village is a public entity doesn't change the fact that this is an arm's length transaction. The property has to be sold at, at fair market value. It's determined by appraised values, which the village is in possession of. Uh, the letter of intent is, is essentially uh, a compilation of what the parties believe the transaction will look like, but it allows for the flexibility to work out the devil in the details, as it were. Um, for example, we're not exactly sure what parcel uh, will work best for this, uh, this facility if uh, we get there. There is a contingency that will be inherently built into any potential uh, contract that's entered into, and that contingency would be that the state would need to grant those licenses that are necessary to for Cresco to begin the operations of uh, medical uh, marijuana farming. Uh, and so uh, while I don't think that we've addressed every possible and conceivable aspect of what could happen as we go down the road, this is designed to let people know uh, what the deal might look like. Uh, and again, the village has the opportunity to walk away at any time because it is non-binding, and for that matter, so does Cresco. Uh, so with that said, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. You have a question? Yeah. Are there other communities uh, that they've looked for that were in competition or are in competition with? Well, I represent the village of Yellow Springs, so I would never be in competition with the village. <laughs> But uh, my understanding is that Cresco has gone through their due diligence and they've looked at other uh, potential parcels uh, throughout the state of Ohio. And I think that they've determined, as uh, Charlie indicated, that the village is an ideal location for this uh, facility of this kind. Uh, the village is, uh, you know, we've had these discussions. I made a presentation to the village well over a year ago on the pros and cons of whether or not there, um, the village should do a moratorium, which many communities have done. Um, I can tell you now that there's a there's another wave of legislation that's hitting municipalities, uh, particularly larger cities, where they want to they're recognizing that there's a possibility for dispensaries in the larger urban areas. So they're layering into their zoning code the ability to to have control of the licenses from a home rule. Uh, uh, perspective. Uh, here in the village we have less concerns than that. I think Charlie's kind of alluded to this. I think it's unlikely there would be a dispensary in, in the village just because there's not enough of a population center here. Um, but uh, again, those are things that are going to be explored down the road. Bill, there was an answer. I was just curious because I'd like to attend other council meetings and see what they're saying. If we had to cover You put Ohio. That's one I just heard about this afternoon. I've got a question. Uh, they brought up that the uh, cost of the road utilities uh, maybe could be significantly cheaper. Do you know if that's because um, the difference in if the village were to build the road utilities, it uh, required prevailing wage? That's correct. Uh, yeah. Versus they're able to pay you know, the cheapest people possible for the utilities. That well, I don't know about the cheapest people possible, no. but certainly prevailing wage is, is, a, is a factor. In it, that. I do want to say that the utilities are going to have to be built to our specs. So while they, while they are going to be able to do it at less than prevailing wage, it's still going to be to our spec. So they're going to have to engage a quality contractor that's going to, that's going to put those in. And, and the village will have inspection rights over the installations as well. On the road, I think after it's built, the village has to maintain it. That's correct. Back with all the roads. Correct. So, yeah. It's got to be a good road. Correct. Is Exhibit A available to or will it be available? It is. We, there was one piece that we had to work out. There's a uh, a, a CAUV issue that because this was farmland uh, and the medical marijuana facility is specifically excluded from tax benefits for CAUV, that there's going to be a three-year recapture of some monies that were spent. We're in the process of calculating that out. That's another, another devil in the detail that we're going to have to, to work through. And, and one thing, um, 
maybe a clarification. I think you've come close to doing it, but it's worth asking. Uh, it sounds like what's being talked about is a sales option. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A straight up sale, which might uh, it, it bears differently on the approval of the licenses. Right. I mean, the option is obviously contingent upon them getting a license. If they really want to come the final sale, sale is well contingent, right? <laughs> but, but the property, you know, they're, they're of course working on the assumption of being successful. The, you know, some, something changing uh, doesn't necessarily put this property on the market being owned by someone else. I'd have to let but council you know, answer that question. It, 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 my understanding of the, the will of council is if they don't get their license, they choose not to exercise their option, the property reverts to the ownership of the village and the sale, isn't the sale is not right. completed. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Any other questions from council? Are we ready to take a vote? Um, all, I, that's a re, is it a resolution? It's a yes, resolution. Right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, um, are we ready to mm -hmm. yes. adjourn? I, I will say, I, I thought this was an excellent discussion. I appreciate all the questions. I appreciate the Cresco team being so prepared um, and open. And um, Come back June 5th. I mean, w and, and I wish we had an agenda. Um, I wish we had the agenda for the next meeting. We do have it prepared. I don't have it here to show but or to, to go over. But we do have a full agenda at the next meeting. This will be a big topic. So um, please come to that meeting and thank you for coming to this one. Yeah, and talk to your council members. If you've got questions, contact us. We want to be as prepared as we can for the next meeting. And, and I'd like to thank the folks that weren't present but did provide uh, comment to me and continue to take comments. Okay. So I'll make a motion to adjourn. Oh, thank you. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.